Hi, this is Dan Cortapassi of TSG Multimedia. Welcome to Model Railroading 101. As usual, I'm sitting in front of the camera, and John's sitting behind the camera making everything look good. Wearing some kind of disguise, probably. <laughs> yeah, like usual. That's what I do. So in this episode, we're going to talk about diesels. And I think in our last podcast, we were saying that we might break it up into two parts, but I'm actually going to break it up into three parts because it's kind of a big topic. Uh-oh. Yeah. So... In this first episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about what diesels are. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of diesels and also why they replace steam engines. And then we'll talk about some of the more common diesels up through about 1960 or so. Sounds like fun. Uh, in episode two, we'll cover circa 1960 to the late 80s. And in episode three, we'll tackle the late 80s to the present. So I think that's a reasonable way to break it up. Any way you break it up is kind of arbitrary, but that kind of made sense to me. So I think we'll go with that. Let's go with that. Yeah. So, and also as usual, this is an introductory program. Um, there wouldn't be time to cover every single model of diesel that's ever been made. And I also don't have models to show for all of them. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I'm positive. Um, as many models as I have, I don't have all of them. Um, <laughs> It just seems like it probably <laughs> yeah, sometimes. So anyway, you know, there may be a few that I end up leaving out. I don't mean to leave out anyone's favorite diesel, but you know, we only have so much time. So, uh, I think we'll just, you know, as usual hit the highlights. So what is a diesel? Diesels work a little different than your family car. A typical highway vehicle has an internal combustion engine. That's either gas or diesel and is connected to the wheels by mechanical linkages. Right, like a drive shaft? Right, or universal joints or transmission, all that good stuff. So a diesel locomotive has a diesel engine usually somewhere in the middle, and some of them have more than one diesel engine, but most of them just have one. And the diesel engine's job is to drive a generator or an alternator that makes electricity. Okay. And usually on each axle, uh, some diesels don't have every axle powered, but usually on each axle, there's an electric motor called a traction motor. And that's what actually makes it go. So each axle has its own motor. So this engine would have four motors because it's a four axle engine. Okay, so, but it would have one engine. One diesel engine. Right. Um, or at least this one has one diesel engine. There are some, like I said, there are some diesels that have more than one engine in them. But um, yeah, typically one diesel engine, one generator, and then that electricity gets sent to all uh, all four traction motors in this case. Oh, I see. Right. One because per axle. you have one per axle. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's how they work, and that's that's known as a diesel electric. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really the correct term for it. Now there have been diesel hydraulic locomotives. Those were kind of something that never really caught on in North America. The best known example is probably the Krauss Maffies that were used by. Uh, Rio Grande and Southern Pacific for a while. Mm -hmm. One of those is being restored at Niles Canyon right now. Yes, it is. 9010. Yeah. Those weren't really a significant part of the North American railroad scene, so I'm not going to talk about them anymore, but I just wanted to mention that those did exist. But most every diesel that is used in North America, past and present, is a diesel electric. So another type of locomotive that was kind of an experimental thing, um, although the Union Pacific had a lot of them, was a gas turbine. And these actually weren't really diesels. I mean, the, there was a little diesel in the A unit on these things so that they could move them. But the main power came from a, basically a jet engine in the B unit. <laughs> and it ran on a different kind of oil, not, not diesel. But the, it was the same principle where they would have, uh, you know, electricity generated to drive traction motors. It should have run on jet fuel. <laughs> yeah. There were a couple of railroads that experimented with these, but um, Union Pacific was probably the biggest uh, user of them for a while in the 50s and, or, you know, through the 60s. I think I saw a picture once of an experimental train that looked like a locomotive with three jet engines attached to the back of it. Yeah, I'm not sure what that was. I mean, that might have been an, I think New York Central experimented with an RDC car that had jet engines on it. I think that's what it was. New York Central sounds familiar. Yeah. I saw a video of it. I was like, oh, wow, really? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to mention these two. They weren't incredibly common, um, but, you know, it's just uh, something else that they tried. To give a very, very brief history of diesels, the first practical diesels came into use on North American railroads in the 1920s. 
Mm -hmm. Back then, they had relatively low horsepower and mostly used for switching. Okay. Road engines like this one we're looking at here started around 1939 when EMD introduced their FT locomotive. This is an F9, but the FT looks similar. That was the first of the F units. And these were designed to do the same job as mainline steam locomotives. Oh, the death knell of steam. Yeah, that was kind of the beginning of the end. And World War II delayed the pace of dieselization a bit because of war production restrictions. Sure, they couldn't manufacture them. Right, but pretty much by the end of the 1950s, steam was all but gone. I brought a couple of steam engines to talk a little bit about why they switched from steam to diesel. Yeah, I was going to say, these aren't diesels. <laughs> no, these are not diesels. <laughs> Even I know that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of reasons why the railroads switched, but one of them I want to talk about is this. These are both 460s. Uh -huh. The one on the right is a Great Northern engine, and the one on the left is a Southern Pacific engine. They look a lot different. They do. Other than the fact that they're both steam engines and they have the same number of wheels, they're totally different. Pretty, pretty much in every way, huh? Yeah. And that's because most steam engines were custom made for each railroad. And imagine being a, a manufacturer and having to maintain parts inventories mm -hmm. for who knows how many railroads across the country. And back then there were a lot more railroads too. Right. So for comparison, here are a couple of F7s. Those look a lot more similar than the steam engines did. Yeah, in fact, they're pretty much identical. There's some detail differences. The Santa Fe one has an extra headlight. But other than that, you know, they're pretty much exactly the same thing. So mechan they, mechanically inside, right? Yeah, you could take parts from one engine and put them in the other engine and it would be fine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the diesel era, manufacturers only offered at any given time a certain limited number of models that the railroads could choose from. So there was a lot of, you know, more parts commonality. Yeah, it's more homogenous this way. Right. Much easier to work with the same model across the board than to have, you know, some bizarrely different pieces for, you know, Southern Pacific only. Yeah. Another reason is that um, diesels are generally cheaper to maintain. Mm -hmm. Steam engines need maintenance every time they're used, whereas diesels will generally run as long as they've got fuel. Run it into the ground, <laughs> man. Yeah, I mean, they do need maintenance, but it's not, not as much. So that was another reason. Also, I've I've seen them whenever they do a stop to refuel or rewater or whatever, the guy gets out with the big grease gun or a big oil can and has to do like 100 points, you know, of lubrication. So I could see there's more moving parts in a steam engine. Right. And steam engines required a lot of infrastructure to support them. Yeah. You know, they had to stop for water all the time. So every few every so many miles they had to have a water tank by the track. Yeah. Um, diesels don't need to do that. You know, there's all kinds of things. A lot of steam engines were also confined to a specific territory. Uh -huh. They would run them, you know, over the division, and then at, then they'd change the engine, send it to the roundhouse for maintenance, get a fresh engine, put it on. It was, a lot of times, diesels, they'll just run right through. Just, they may change the crew, uh -huh. but, you know, the, they don't need to take the engine off. Well, I, I think that part about water bears some expansion because... If you think about that, you're not just having to put fuel in the in the thing. You're having to deal with two different commodities. Right. Which is a pain in the butt. Right. So I can totally see that. Yeah. Hey, it's lopsided. <laughs> yeah. Well, another thing that diesels can do that steam engines can't is they have a thing called multiple unit capability. Oh, MU. MU, yeah. And what that means is, let's say that your train is too much for one diesel. Oh. You hook them together, and now you have a locomotive that's twice as powerful. If you need more, you can hook up a third one. If you need more, you can hook up a fourth one. And you still only need one crew because they're all wired together, and they act like one big locomotive. Oh, well, that, that means your crew size could be a lot smaller. Right, because in the steam days, if they needed to double head, you had to have two separate crews, and they had to be really good because they had to coordinate with each other and make sure they were doing the same thing at the same time. Right, without radios. Without radios, yeah, in the days before radios. <laughs> so, you know, that was not an easy thing to do. So with diesels, there's no need for that. Yeah. You just hook up as many as you need. Another thing that diesels have, or at least a lot of diesels have, is dynamic braking. Oh. So what does that mean? Well, when the engines are going downhill, uh -huh. they can turn all those traction motors on the wheels into generators. Okay. 
And what that does is it absorbs some of the energy of the train rolling down the hill and slows it down. Oh, it slows it down without having to use brakes? Is that right. Yeah. So you can save the air brakes a little bit. And the light gets real bright. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, actually, most of that energy is just dissipated as heat. Yeah. Um, they have special fans for that on engines that are equipped with dynamic braking. But um, most of the railroads, especially ones that operated in mountainous territory, uh, ordered that option on their engines. I would, too. Another thing about diesels is that uh, generally, they're a cleaner environment for the crews. You know, oh, you're inside, huh? Right. Steam engine cab is not a very clean place. It's it's dirty, especially on a coal-fired steam engine. Oh, yeah. Even on the oil-fired one. <laughs> believe me, I've been in a few, and they yeah. are... Anywhere you touch, you get the stuff on your hand. It's greasy, Every and half the other stuff in the cab is really hot, and you don't want to touch it. <laughs> um, diesels, you know, it's like being in a, you know... It's a car Turk or something. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, so it's a, a little more comfortable environment. So basically, you know, it was just diesels are easier to maintain. They're more versatile and, uh, you know, there's not as much labor cost involved. Yeah. And they're more employee friendly. Right. So for all those reasons, that's, that's kind of why they killed steam. Back in the early days of diesels, probably the two biggest manufacturers were EMD and Alco. Oh, right. EMD was the electromotive division of General Motors. Yes. And Alco used to build steam engines, and they switched over to diesels. Uh, Baldwin was another steam engine company that also made diesels, and Fairbanks Morse was another company that made diesels. And there were a few others, but those were kind of the major ones. So a lot of the steam companies sort of migrated to diesel, didn't they? They tried to. Yeah. Um, Alco was probably the most successful of them. Because I know Baldwin did steamers, too. Right. And General Electric was also making diesels at the time, but they were mostly making small, like, switchers and things, and they also made components for other manufacturers. Smart idea. Yeah, but they hadn't really become the big powerhouse diesel manufacturer that they are today. Mm -hmm. So these are EMDF units, and these are probably one of the most, if not the most, iconic diesels of all time. Yeah, these are, aren't these called streamliners? Yeah, they're um, actually what you call cab units. Okay. Which means that they have a full width body that's actually structural. It's not just there for decoration. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were FTs were the original ones. I don't have a model of one of those, but they look pretty similar to these. And then there were a bunch of other models, including the F3, mm -hmm. F7s, and F9s. Right. And then they also had an FP7, which was a stretched version of of the F7, actually this one in the back, the Western Pacific engine is a FP7, that had room for a steam generator. Oh, for, for passenger cars? Right, yeah. for passenger service. So they're just a little bit longer than a normal F7. Mm -hmm. And the, the Rio Grande unit is an F9. And they also had one called an FL9, which was actually a five axle locomotive that was used mostly in New York. And it could run as a diesel or as an electric with a third rail electric pickup. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, but those were pretty much confined to just that region. So F units and some other diesels came in A unit and B unit varieties. So the A units are the ones with the cab. Uh, B units are identical except that they have no cab. Oh, yeah. So the B units are pretty much only usable when coupled to an A unit. So initially the F and F units stood for 1,400 horsepower, which is, I guess, close to what the original FTs had. Okay. The later F3s and through F7s had 1,500 Hmm. Some people also called them covered wagons because they thought they resembled a Conestoga wagon. <laughs> I guess because of the rounded roof. Compared to a steam engine, they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but otherwise, it doesn't look anything like a wagon to me anyway. Yeah. So one thing that's kind of interesting, just to give you some idea of how big a diesel engine is inside, F units had 16-cylinder 567 diesel prime movers, and the 567 is the cubic inch displacement of one cylinder. That's that's pretty huge. Yeah. That means that that's like one cylinder has more displacement than a big block Chevy V8. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Jeez. No wonder they rumble. <laughs> yeah. So this is some pretty big engines. Initially, most F units were sold in sets. Oh, so you had to get an A and a B or what? Well, that's just the way most railroads did it. They'd order hmm. ABA sets or ABBA sets. And uh -huh. a lot of times they were even numbered the same. Some of that had to do with union rules because initially I think there was some dispute about if it was four units, they needed four crews. Oh, some antiquated specifications in the contract. Probably. Right. Yeah. So they got around that by declaring it 
you know, kind of to be one locomotive. Hmm. Well, and, I mean, it makes sense though. Like yeah. you don't need a crew for a B. Look, right. <laughs> I'm as pro union as you get, but I don't think you need a, a, no. a crew for a B unit. No. So uh, like on the Santa Fe, um, this, this engine here would be 304 L mm -hmm. and then the B units would be 304 A and B. I know that sounds weird that they would call the B unit A, but anyway, that's the way they did it. And then the, <laughs> the other A unit would be 304 C. And then later, Later in their careers, a lot of times they were broken up and used as individual engines. Uh -huh. So if you see, you know, a Santa Fe F unit that's 304 and then you see 304C, those aren't the same engine. Two different engines. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. So Whatever. A lot of railroads did stuff like that. They didn't always have the same new, uh, nomenclature. Nomenclature, yeah, but they, they would do stuff like that with the, with the numbering. Alco also had a model, which I don't have one, but it was called an FA, which was kind of the same idea. Um, it was a little more boxy looking. But those were also kind of like F units, just, uh, you know, they came in A's and B's and were four axles. Oh, okay. So F units were pretty versatile, too. They could be used for freight or passenger service, depending on how they were set up. Oh, right, with that steam generator thing? Yeah, and sometimes the B units had steam generators, even if the A units didn't. So um, railroads didn't always need to go for the FP7s. Oh, so you could have a regular F7 with no steam generator, as long as you put it with a B... F7B that had a steam generator, right. you could run that with, huh, that's a cool idea. Yeah. So EMD also made something called an E-unit, which looked kind of like a stretched F-unit. Mm -hmm. These rode on six axle trucks, and actually the center axle on each truck is an idler, so they only have four traction motors. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, that's the way they were made. And these actually had two diesel engines inside. The E stood for 1,800 horsepower from two 900 horsepower diesels in the early E units. The later models had more horsepower. Oh, interesting. I've always noticed that they had the extra axle, but I never knew that that axle wasn't powered. It almost seems like why have an extra axle if it's, it's not even powered? I would, I would, I'm not sure, but I would guess it's probably for weight distribution. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Considering because it's a you know bigger engine, it just seems to me like if you're going to have it there, it should be powered. You know? Yeah, of course. You know, if you consider that these are mostly these had steam generators, they were mostly intended as passenger engines. So it's not like they were lugging heavy freight trains over mountains. Yeah. So you you, know? didn't, you didn't need the traction. No, yeah. you need, they were more built for speed than anything. So yeah. you know that's kind of how they were designed. So Alco also made a six axle passenger diesel uh, called the PA. Wait, did you say PA or PA? PA. Okay. Yeah. And uh, these are PA1s, but they were PA2s and so forth. But they also had a center idler axle and only four traction motors. Well, who, which one came out first? I don't know. Somebody copied somebody. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm getting at. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, they were they were competitors, you know. Yeah. Al Alco and EMD were kind of the big competitors in, in, in that time. So diesel manufacturers also made what are called hood units. Hood units have a narrower body and walkways on the side, like this oh, one. Right. I see what you're saying. Because the F unit, the cab went all the way across, and the whole thing went all the way across. But in this one, it doesn't. What is that, for visibility? Or? Yeah, for visibility. And I think it's also a little easier for them to get to things with maintenance, because mm -hmm. they just open up the doors and get to it. Uh, the inside of an F unit is fairly cramped. Oh, yeah. I've heard people refer to that as a submarine. <laughs> yeah. And the, yeah, you're right. They do have better visibility because I actually got a chance to drive an F unit one time up at the Western Pacific Railroad Museum yeah. in Portola. And when you're backing up, you really don't see much of anything. How could you? <laughs> yeah. Your cab faces forward and all you have is a mirror. Right. You know, these are a little more versatile that way. This is a GP7, and this is pretty much equivalent to an F7. It has 1,500 horsepower, same as an F7, hmm. four traction motors, and... Pretty much the same power, but it's in a different package. Yeah. And this is what's known as a road switcher, meaning that this engine could be used for just about any duty, switching or freight or sometimes even passenger service if it had a steam generator, which some of them did. Yeah, I think, didn't SP used to use Jeeps like this on the on the run between San Francisco and San Jose? Yeah, they did. And, and further south, too, for that matter. Right. I remember seeing pictures of those. Yeah. So the GP7 was the first of many other... Uh, subsequent GP models. And GP stands for general purpose, kind of reflecting the notion that the locomotive could do just about anything. Uh -huh. So these are GP9s, which were the successor to the GP7. And these were pretty similar in appearance, but they had uh, 1,750 horsepower instead of 1,500. Okay. And you might notice that the roofs are a little different. 
Um, they could be set up different ways, and they also varied during their production life. The later ones had fewer fans. Okay. What, now, why is that? Do you know? I don't know. At some point, EMD went from the two smaller fans to one larger fan. Oh, it must have moved more air. Probably. And sometimes modelers re refer to that as uh, production phases. Like this is a phase two GP9, and this is a phase three. But EMD didn't use that term. That's just sort of something that rail fans and modelers use okay. as a spotting feature. Uh, and the one in the middle is called a torpedo tube unit because it has its air tanks on top. Oh, instead of by the tank, the right. fuel tank? Yeah. And this one doesn't have dynamic brakes. So this this was one of the engines that SP had for the commute run in, um, on the peninsula in between oh, San Francisco like I was and just San talking, Jose. Yeah. yeah, like I was just talking about. Right. So this one has a steam generator and no dynamic brakes because that's pretty much a flat route. Um, these two have dynamic brake fans. So you so. might find those working on a pass somewhere? Yeah, those would be more general purpose freight engines, and this one would be a passenger engine. Alco had an RS series, um, this is an RS-11, that was kind of uh, a competitor to the GP-7s and 9s. Yeah, it looks a lot like it. Yeah, it's another uh, four-axle kind of all-purpose diesel. And uh, they also had RS-1s, 2s, 3s, and you know some other ones. Yeah. You know, it really doesn't matter now because Alco is gone anyway, but uh -huh. I am very curious to know which company copied the other one? Because this looks just like those Jeeps that we were looking at. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's kind of similar and, in design, the, yeah. Their FA or FL or whatever it was, I forget now, the looked PA? a lot like oh, yeah. PA. PA. Well, they had an it, FA too. But oh. the, the PA, PA and the FA look similar, but the FAs are shorter. Yeah. That Alco PA thing looked a lot like the e EMD E units. So, yeah, well, they're similar so, in, in so function. Somebody was copying, and I want to know, hey, <laughs> One of the viewers knows. <laughs> so if you know who was copying whom, put it in the comments because I want to know. Okay. On hood units, the end closer to the cab is called the short hood, and the other end is the long hood. And diesels work just as well going backwards or forwards. And there's a little F on one end that designates which end is the front. Oh, right. Yeah, and that's important because some diesels were set up to run long hood forward. Yeah, didn't they do that in the south someplace? Norfolk and Western and Southern uh, were two of the railroads that ran them that way. Uh, but some of the other railroads did too, especially in the early days. It seems like they wouldn't want to because the, the sight lines are funky. Yeah, I think they thought it was more crew protection and it was more like a steam locomotive, you know, with the cab in the back. Oh, right. So they were used to that. Right. Yeah. Um, but that kind of went away after a while. Now almost everything is short hood forward. Anyway, mostly that had to do with which side of the locomotive the engineer's control stand was on because the engineer sits on the right-hand side. Some diesels had dual controls, and they could run in both directions. I mean, any diesel can run in both directions, but it just made it more convenient. You mean the, the engineer could have sat on either side? Right. Yeah. They would have uh, two control stands instead of one. Most diesels just have one, and if they want to run the other way, the engineer just has to turn around. Mm -hmm. Another thing about hood units is that they're often run in pairs facing opposite directions so that the power doesn't have to be turned at the end of the line. Uh -huh. The crew just moves to the cab in the other unit. Um, that's another advantage that diesels had over steam because steam engines were often turned to face forward when they had to go back the way they came. That's what turntables were used mostly for, wasn't it? Right. I've seen these models before. Yeah, I think you've seen one of them anyway. The, the one um, in front. The yeah. one in front, yeah. The one in front is an SD9, and the one in back is an SD7. And these are pretty much the equivalent of a GP7 or GP9, um, except in a longer body with six-axle trucks. Oh, right. That's the spotting feature I use for distinguishing SD and GP. Right. Uh, SD was EMD's nomenclature for special duty. Uh -huh. And these were, engines had all axles powered. And they were designed for more traction. So these would have been the engines you would see hauling heavy freight trains over hills and things like that. Oh, okay. The SD7s came first. Those had 1,500 horsepower, and then the SD9s had 1,750. So you can have a 1,500 horsepower engine with six-axle trucks, uh -huh. and you can have a 1,500 horsepower engine with four-axle trucks, but the six-axle truck locomotive is still more powerful, isn't it? Well, it has more tractive effort. Right. That's what I mean by powerful. It's right. the same power. Horse it's power the same is horsepower, the same. but it has more tractive effort. Right, because it has more surface to surface from the wheels to the rails pulling power, basically. That's what I'm right. talking about. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. 
so SD sevens and nines were primarily freight engines, but um, some of them did have uh, steam generator equipment for passenger use. Oh, neat. Alco also had six axle units. This is a RSD five. See, they they didn't copy them with this one. Yeah, this one looks a little different. Um, looks almost like a weird car or something. Yeah. Uh, Alco did have some models that had higher hoods like the RS11, mm -hmm. but this, uh, they also had some like this. This is an EMD SD24, which was kind of like a successor to the SD9. Okay. Um, this is a turbocharged engine, and it had 2,400 horsepower. These are, came out in 1958. That's probably the highest horsepower of anything to that date, isn't it? Yeah, and they were also starting to go to more low hoods. It was, it was an option, but... Um, gave better visibility for the crew mm -hmm. in the front. Though a lot of railroads ordered high hood units uh, much later. Yeah, uh, I think I remember seeing high hood, I think they were Norfolk Southern or something. Yeah, Southern and They're, Norfolk and Western especially yeah, ordered a lot GP of them. GP20 or GP35s or something. That yeah, were even SD40-2s. Oh, they, really? They were yeah, high hoods? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, we're getting um, ahead of ourselves. Yeah, we're not, not, not getting to that yet. But anyway, I wanted to show this because it's kind of an evolution of the SD9 idea. It's basically the same wheelbase but just a you know more powerful locomotive. Another common six-axle diesel of the era, and I don't have a model of one to show, unfortunately, was the Fairbanks Morse H2466 Trainmaster, which produced 2,400 horsepower. Oh, nice. So Alco also made switchers. This is an S2. They had S1s and S2s and 3s and 4s, and I think up to 6. They're basically similar in, you know, to the EMDs. They had end cabs uh -huh. and four axles, four traction motors. Someone's copying someone again. Yeah. At the other end of the size spectrum, you have switchers. Yeah, this thing's really small. Yeah, this is a little uh, General Electric 45-ton switcher that would have been mostly used in industrial kind of applications. I mean, one, one or one or two cars, something like that? Yeah, you know, pushing cars around a plant or something. So this is what's known as a center cab switcher, since the cab is in the center. Oh, I see. And it looks like he can go either direction just as easily because the cab also has windows all around it, huh? Right. So Electromotive made some switchers, too. Um, a lot of theirs were end cab switchers, meaning the cab is on the end. Oh, I see. And uh, they had models including, this is an SW8, but they also had NW2s and SW9s. Um, they were all kind of about the same size. And these would have been used in yards or sometimes in industrial uh, applications as well. Uh-huh. And they, they could also get out on the road once in a while, but mostly they were, you know, switching cars and yards. Yeah, you know, I, I think I I seem to recall seeing a switcher similar to this in a UP consist, part of a power lash-up that came out of the UP yard in Stockton, or maybe it went into it. Do you remember yeah. that? It's on a day at Stockton. Yeah, well, that's a much newer engine, but yeah. yeah. Some of these engines had MU capability and some didn't. It was, uh, I think there was an option. Oh, the, I see. The railroads right. could um, specify. Because sometimes switchers just w worked by themselves all the time, so they didn't really need it. Uh -huh. Usually you can tell, because if they have a bunch of hoses on the pilots, then they're MEU capable. If they don't, then they're not. This is a Fairbanks Morse H1244 switcher. And this was also kind of a, another similar switcher of the era. It had an end cab. This one had a taller hood on it. Yeah, I can see that. But it was pretty much used for the same purposes, you know, switching cars and yards and that kind of thing. Yeah, it looks like it's that size, right? Yeah. This is a Baldwin VO1000. Again, same idea. Yeah. End cab, short, small. Yeah, four switching. axles. Yeah. yeah. So those were some of the common switchers of the, you know, time period up through about 1960 or so. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight into the early part of the diesel era. And we'll pick it up next time and continue on with sort of the middle part, I guess you could call it. Yeah, as usual, there's some stuff that I knew that I was reminded of, and there was some stuff that was new. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, I usually end up having to go to the bathroom at the end of these things. So uh, maybe I should go now. Okay, you do that. Okay.